Okay, the um, <clears throat> name of this class is the Supreme Being. It actually, um, the actual name, but it's easier to put it on the board like that, and it's easier to say to you, but the actual name is Claiming the True View of the Supreme Being. Claiming the True View of the Supreme Being. And just to talk a little bit about it, there's a lot of, going to be a lot of reading because this wasn't written as a Bible class. Um, uh, it may sound like a book, but it wasn't meant to be written as a book. It was um, a personal study that I was, I don't know, something had just hit me when, when someone, I heard someone talking and they, talk, they referred to God as the supreme being. And I went, hmm, you know, my little wheels start turning. <clears throat> but it took me a long time. It took me several years of my own study to, to do this. And um, so what will, when I read it, you'll find out that I'm talking more about the being part. Uh, and then about halfway to two-thirds of the way through, I'll be talking about the supreme aspect but I'll be talking about that in relationship to um, what I've termed orientation, which is orientation can be understood as which orientation, up or down, you know, that, that sort of thing instead of uh, this is orientation class and we're going to discuss, you know, so um, let's see. In this, thing is going to keep going down to Debbie's size, which is exciting. All right, so um, let me just start with a little introduction. I would like to begin this by not placing labels on God or describing him in a manner that is familiar to our minds. Okay, so we're so much of of the things of God we think we know. I, uh, for example, I taught a class many years ago and I probably wrote a book on it. Um, Kelly, you've taught it several times. What is the one that, that, that is all the attributes of God? You know, in, um, all powerful, all knowing, all, you know, attributes of God, anyway. You can talk about the attributes of God. You can talk about, well, he, he knows everything. He's all powerful. He's all, you know, he's um, <clears throat> all these things, but they're not really him. They're a bunch of attributes that we have observed. They're attributes that we have observed from God. But, um, but you know, you can, see, you can see attributes from anybody and it'll tell you somewhat about them, but it doesn't tell you them. This tells you stuff that they do and the way that they are, so we say that's them. But there, there is a real being in there that is, um, uh, that is more than its attributes. Uh, I'm sure, surely someone here remembers me talking about this at another time in another class where I was talking about, well, here's what I mean. So I gave an example of somebody having a little kitty, and the little kitty's name was Fluff. And Fluff was their favorite little pet, and they just loved him, just a little tiny kitty. And said, I just love Fluff, and you know, it's so sweet, and so, so pretty, and so da 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 da. And uh, so one day they were gonna go away for a week and they entrusted Fluff to their best friend. And their best friend was just like, man, I've never heard of a cat like this and I've never met Fluff, but you know, they told me so much about Fluff, you know, and, and what a great kitty they are. And so when the peop owner left, they took Fluff and they said, man, I really wanna, I wanna know Fluff, you know, from the inside. So he took a scalpel and he opened up Fluff and he started pulling out the different parts and he's going, oh yeah, yeah, oh okay, yeah. This is kind of what we do with God. 
We pull out all the parts and look at them, but we never see it as the being that is moving those parts. Does that help a little bit? My great little examples that nobody would ever think of unless they've got a sick mind. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but that's, you know, I mean, it gets the point across, doesn't it? I mean, you actually see, oh my God, you know, the owner didn't love fluff because of all the inward stuff. It was the personality and the being that was in fluff. <clears throat> all right, so that's why I wrote. I would like to begin by not placing labels on God or describing him in a manner that is familiar to our minds. Okay, so familiar to our minds would be pulling out those parts and saying this is God and this is God and this is God. But to really begin to meet him, to really begin to know him as he is. <clears throat> uh, to do so tends to send the reader down a path or the student down a path of interpreting everything that is said in light of our own present knowledge, which is absolutely the truth. You start talking about, you know, God and all this kind of stuff, and, and usually we are weighing everything, each person is, in light of what we know. And not everybody knows the same stuff. So we're, we're really judging what's being said, not just in this class, but all classes. We're judging what's being said based on what we've seen. Now, I know this for a fact because I did it for years. <clears throat> and um, I remember very early in my walk, somebody was preaching and I was listening to him and I said, well, that can't be right. Well, that can't be right. That's what I said. And I said that based on what I knew at the time, which was like a two-year-old at best, <laughs> I was judging what they were saying by what I knew, and what I knew was right, but I don't know if what they know is right. Do you understand that? You know, because it's like, well, <clears throat> I'm all-knowing, and this can't be right because I didn't know this before. Well, we're not all-knowing, and we need to know the Lord, and we need to know him beyond our own understanding right now. We need to know him beyond my understanding. We need to know him as the Spirit of God wants to reveal him. <clears throat> Partially the reason why I'm sharing on this is because it is meant to break down all the things that don't represent being, first of all, I guess, so that we can begin to understand being, you know, because I will tell you this, God's being is completely different than ours. He moves, and this is going to be one of the main premises, but he moves completely based on his being. He does not move like we do. We don't move by our being. We move by our feelings, right? We move by... Uh, what we who we perceive is nice to us or not nice to us. We move based on um, circumstances that come our way, and we're moving by that. God's not moved by any of that. He is moved strictly by his own internal being. So you, you, do you see the big difference between us and God right there? And that point's going to be made over and over with different scriptures and examples to show that this is huge to begin to know God based on the being side of who he is. <clears throat> um, so I'll read that again. To, to do so tends to send the reader down a path of interpreting everything that is said in light of our own present knowledge. <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So when I did that way back when, and I said, well, that can't be right, then I started noticing that as I heard people share, I would go, that's right, because it matched up with what I already knew. But I said, well, that's not right, because it didn't match up with what I already knew. And I, I, I realized at a certain point, um, and I, I'm sure the Holy Spirit was the one who moved on me, but I, I came to the realization that um, to do that says that I know everything and no one else really knows what I know. Because I'm judging by, you know, 
I mean, so I determined in my heart that I was going to change that. Well, how do you how do you change that? Well, I changed it by saying, you know what? Uh, I, I remember what scripture I latched on, actually. And it was the one where it talked about the, the angel of the Lord talking to Mary that you're going to bring forth the son. And she's going, what? I'm a young girl? I'm a virgin? What? How can this, how can this be? You know, and it was interesting, those wordings. How can this be? So the angel goes, okay, I'll tell you how. The Spirit of God's going to come on you and, you know, overshadow you and da-da-da-da. That's how it can be. Well, she's, I'm sure she's thinking more in terms of, well, how can a virgin da-da-da-da and all this kind of, and I'm not even married. And she even said that stuff. I'm not even married or da-da-da-da. <clears throat> so with all of that confusion and all of that going off in her head, going off in my head, she said, okay, be it unto me according to thy word. Okay, the word of God. Be it unto me according to thy word. All right. So, uh, and it also said that she pondered these things in her heart. And I saw both. I said, man, you know, number one, I need to know the word better because somebody could be saying something that's straight out of the word. And if I didn't know it, I'd go, well, that ain't God. You know, I mean, that's the way I was. Can you believe that? I would do stuff like that. Isn't that shocking? I'm glad y'all never would do that. <laughs> and the other one was ponder these things. And I remember sort of making an agreement with the Holy Spirit that I would never just swallow everything hook, line, and sinker. Do you, do you understand that terminology? It's like a fish hook for a fish. And so the fish takes the bait, but he swallows the hook, and then you pull him in. So it's, I'm not going to swallow this hook, line, and sinker, nor am I going to reject it, but I'm going to ponder it. It's not saying it's true. It's not saying it couldn't be true. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? It's saying, I'm pondering this, and, you know, Holy Spirit, you, in your timing, because uh, one of the things I found out was that <clears throat> um, I, would, I would question something, and then years later, I would see it in the scripture or something. I'd go, oh, my God, there it is. I thought they were making it up, <laughs> you know. And, I, you know, wow, you feel really bad because, you know, then I wasn't going against that guy. I was going against the Lord and what was in his word. And so <clears throat> be it unto me according to your word. Be it unto me, you know, in that manner. And also, Lord, I'm, I'm not going to expect an answer right now. And that, for example, someone's teaching and they're saying something I don't understand. And I go, you know, show me right now. Well, he doesn't usually do that. He's, I remember also me saying stuff like that, and he would just come to me and say, look, there are a lot of other things you need to get in you before this. This will be a lot more effective in you if you wait on my timing instead of just because you, you know, you know like a little kid at the, at the fair going on, can I have cotton candy? Can I have a sucker? Can I have ice cream, you know? And the father's going, look, this isn't good for you. Oh, no, it's good. It's real good for me. The Father knows, and he knows the timing. And, and the revealing of Christ is an appointed time of the Father, as mentioned in Galatians 4. So all of those things became important as I approached new areas so that I could genuinely be with the Lord and at least be with the... Uh, I know that... To this day, um, if I'm listening to somebody or if I'm reading somebody's book and, and it's like, I don't get that, I put a question mark beside it. Not to say I question this. I put that question mark beside it so that I can go back and reread it and reread it and reread it until I go, I either go, I, I don't get it. 
doesn't, still doesn't mean it's not true. Or I go, oh, that's what you're saying. That, sh yeah, of course, you know. So those question marks help me to, to go back with the Holy Spirit. It's almost like he's showing me stuff. Let's say if I'm listening or if I'm reading, he's showing me stuff all along. But all of a sudden I come across something I don't understand, question mark. That means, hey, buddy, we need to go back later on and look at this closer. I need you to show me what that means because I don't get it. All right. <clears throat> so... Um, from time to time, we will mention God's DNA. All right. Well, God doesn't have DNA, but we're talking about the essence, the genuine thing that is him, not the attributes of fluff that we're trying to dig out and go, hey, I know this now about him. We're trying to know him, and he is one, okay? So it's not, it's not as complicated as we would think. But we have all these attributes and stuff. For, for example, I mean, we could, we, could say, we could say, well, you know, what is the being of God? You know, so we'd say, well, he's the supreme being. Let me see. Maybe I can do this. Maybe I can. Maybe I'm going to have to break this thing out of here. All right, I think I can reach it now. I can't. <laughs> All right, so we, we come over here and we say supreme being. So right now I'm just putting it on the board as SB, supreme being. Okay, what does that equal? Okay, we got this broken board here, but it equals God. Okay, supreme being equals God. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of ways that we can go with that one. But if we just sort of make it simple right now, then we would say, well, that's Jesus. Okay? Okay, and then we would say that um, Jesus came to reveal, because he's the express image of God, to reveal God. So then we're back to God. Then we say, okay, um, so I'm making this up as I go here. Then we say, um, well, but God is Jesus. So since we don't get anything more than we got over here when we first said God, we go back to Jesus and we say, okay, what is God? Okay. And then we say, well, let's look at Jesus of Nazareth. That's what we usually do. Okay, so we say, well, he's, um, he does a lot of miracles, including feeding people and healing people and raising the dead. And, uh, <clears throat> and he's, you know, he died for us. Okay, so we say he died for us. He died for us. We don't say he's the Lamb of God, or we don't say he's, you know, we say he died for us. Okay, so we name off all of those things that he did, and we say that's the supreme being. Okay, well, it was at the cross that he came to reveal who the Father was, who, who God is. But even knowing that, we still are confronted with a, two pieces of wood and a person dying on it and trying to figure out how that is the being of God. Okay, so in light of all that, this is probably similar to a trip that I took on all this. Um, it, it made me... Uh, I wanted to know the true God, and I wanted to know him beyond his attributes. Uh, and another example that I've used over the years, but, you know, there could be a, a girl that visits a carpenter, and she says, would you make for me, and this is probably a little different than, but would you make for me a, um, 
a dining room table. And he says, sure, it'll cost this much. And, um, uh, and I'll have it done in two weeks. So she says, um, oh, I don't have that much money. And he goes, well, that's all right. He gets real soft. He says, that's all right. That's OK. I'll tell you what, I'm going to make the price this. Um, so um, she comes back two weeks later. <clears throat> table's all finished. She says, I don't have the rest of the money. I, I'm gonna, I, in a month, I'm going to have the money. So he goes, um, you know, take all the time you want. So she's going, this, this guy is so nice. You know, he's so nice. He's such a great guy, you know. And um, so, of course, we're talking about in the time, at time of Jesus. So, uh, so one day she's in town and she's walking around. And she walks by his shop, and in the back of the shop is his house with his wife and kids. And he's back there going, you idiot, talking to his wife. You should have done this, and da 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 and all this kind of stuff, and, oh, and you know, everything. And she was judging him by how good the, the quality of the table was, which was excellent, and how nice he was in dealing with her momentarily, but didn't know his being. Let this be a warning to you girls. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good thing to know because, you know, on FaceTime or anything, you can be as nice as you want, you know. Like I, like I said, you know, I, you know, on Facebook you can say, oh, I love long walks, you know, in the park and in the woods, you know, and, you know, they never say, and I also like to have a sharp stick and stick animals, you know, with it. You know, they, they don't mention that, you know. <laughs> you know, because they'll get zero. What's the point of putting anything up there? So you got to, and, and what am I, you know, don't laugh, girls. Y'all do the same thing. Y'all might even be worse. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> guys aren't as creative <laughs> just to go into all of this stuff. The girls can really pour it on. The guy goes, this girl's pe perfect for me. You know, I'm standing there, don't do it. <laughs> All right. From time to time, we will mention God's DNA. Of course, we do not use this term in a literal sense, for God's makeup is spiritual, not physical. What we are referring to is how those who have entered into a oneness relationship with God or of his kind, they are of his kind, out from him in the manner as to how parents would have children that are out from uh, their very own substance. Even so, we are to bear his nature and image because we have his makeup and essence dwelling within us. All right, so um, Caitlin spent time with, uh, at the Turner Falls uh, rooming with Cassie. And she came away with one of these statements. She said to me, Cassie's a lot like you. Well, I didn't get offended because it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Cassie, I hope you're not watching this. Your name's not on the board. <clears throat> but, but I say proudly, she is a lot like me. And she's, she's got my sense of humor. She, there's a, many, many, many attributes that she gets from me. Those others come from Deb, but. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, my mom had real light blue eyes. When I was born, I was the only one in the family with light blue eyes. We had three brothers and two sisters. Um, uh, when I had kids, my oldest daughter, Natalie, had light blue eyes like mine. When she had two sons, one of them had brown eyes and the other one had light blue eyes. And he's not married yet, but I got a feeling that, you know, this is gonna be passed down, you know, from generation to generation. What? 
put it on Facebook. <laughs> We're not on Facebook, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, it's just the way girls think. It's okay. <laughs> Here's the way guys think. I don't want no blind date with some girl I don't know. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> enough of that. So I think we're getting the idea of, of why we're calling it DNA, because we're doing it because it represents the very substance and essence that produces blue eyes or that produces this trait or that trait. The blue eyes are not the thing that you're after when it, you know, when it comes to God. Because, for example, you know, the first great movie I ever saw about Jesus was called Jesus of Nazareth. And that dude had really blue eyes, okay? And so it would continually show, you know, you know and, and you'd sit there and go, okay, I've, I'm, not, I'm not really where I should be with you. <laughs> right? <laughs> and... Well, there's a good chance, well, let's just put it this way. We were two weeks ago, maybe two and a half, three weeks ago, we were in another state and we were in a mall and we got to talking to a guy who was uh, Israeli. He wasn't just Jewish, he was Israeli. And so I mentioned to him, you know, that I'm a Jew and he said, no, you're not. And I said, he goes, you're not. And I said, why not? And he said, Jews have brown eyes. Okay, first let's use that for Jesus of Nazareth, <laughs> the movie. He probably didn't have blue eyes. Okay, number two, <clears throat> so I said, he said, what's your last name? And I said, Nussbaum. And he goes, that's the last name of the, the biggest uh, news person in all of Israel. It's his last name. And I said, so I told him a little bit of the story. <clears throat> so he said, so you really are, you know, a Jew? And I said, well, I'm Jew-ish, you know. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> um, Let's see. Even so, we are to bear his nature and image because we have his makeup and his essence dwelling within us. Okay, if we're born again. All right. Most people that really consider their relationship with God don't even think about the same makeup and essence basically found in a person that is within us, Jesus. They think in terms of, I'm born again. Not that I'm born of an incorruptible seed, which is Christ, but that I'm born again <clears throat> and that um, now I'm a Christian and that is identified by things that Christians do. Christians do what? They pray. Does that make anybody spiritual? N no, praying doesn't. Hopefully your prayers are spiritual because you are, but praying doesn't ricochet back and all of a sudden make you spiritual. Number two, God's keeping track of all your prayers and you're in trouble. Not really. Number two, what does <laughs> I'm kidding. Number two, what does a Christian do? Well, he reads his Bible. Okay. Um, and we go, okay, well, reading your Bible makes you spiritual. Well, reading your Bible, if done correctly, while you're seeking not, you know, uh, there's a there's an area I could go to right now, but the Lord's still sharing with me on it. But if we're not searching to be conformed to the image of Christ, to see his face and to be changed, then it's, you know, there's a book on Abraham Lincoln and there's a book on Abraham and it doesn't make any difference. It's still ink on white paper until the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God. And, and we read it, and we, as soon as we open it, we say, I want to know you, and I want to know your heart. Not I want to know some, you know, nice little thing that I can impress everybody with, or, or I want to know some spiritual thing that I can, you know, hold on to and say I'm more spiritual now. I mean, your spirituality is based on an increase of Christ. That's what it is. That's what your spirituality is. 
It's Christ. And so, but it's Christ in you. That's the difference. It's not Christ up there. All right. So, um, unlike much of Christianity, our emphasis will not be so much focused on the supreme aspect of the supreme being, but upon his being. The word being will be referred to a lot, and it will be. I mean, in this thing that I've written, both in regards to God and man, because we think that in our being we received God, meaning I, I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, instead of he has become the being of the believer. And like I said, we're going to go through a lot of scriptures to show this, all right? <clears throat> so, the, so the prayer, so the, the prayer is guided by the heart, and the heart is guided by the spirit that's come to, that we might have Christ revealed in us. And, and so we go to the word, or we go to prayer, we go to anything. I, you know, um, it's better to just pray a few words with a heart than it is a whole bunch of words. And Jesus proved that, remember what he said to the Pharisees? You love to stand up there and say all that and pray for hours and stuff like that. He said, go in your closet and pray. Well, what did he mean by that? He meant, you're doing all this for show. You're just doing it so people will think you're spiritual. We have the same story today in Christianity, but it's usually not standing on a corner and praying because we wouldn't think that person was spiritual today. So we don't do that because we want to look spiritual. Get it? You follow that little trail up to where we are today? So we do the things you do. I don't know what they are. I'm too spiritual to know that. It's a joke. It's a joke on Skype. I'm only kidding. <clears throat> All right. Because the people here go, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, you're spiritual. <clears throat> um, Uh, it must be said that there are many similarities between what I share here and a book I wrote in my 30s, 30 years old, some odd. The book was entitled The True Gospel, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Anybody read it here? Okay. Good. It's a terrible book. <laughs> nah, it'll, it'll bless you. However, there are many more major differences that will eventually lead to a broader bringing forth of God's being that we're discussing now. Okay, so I have this divided into chapters because it helps me to organize and outline. You all understand that? If you're going to write a whole lot, it's good to know how to outline. And one good way to do that is chop it up. And, and uh, one way to chop it up is to just put your thoughts in chapters. <clears throat> okay, so reading uh, Matthew 3, 17, if you want to turn there with me. <clears throat> Matthew 3, 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. All right. A couple of things there that maybe we have noticed, maybe we haven't. <clears throat> Did I tell you Matthew? Okay. It's interesting that it doesn't say, and the heavens were open and the Father spoke. It says, lo, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, Okay, so what's the, what's the big deal of that? What's the big deal of any scripture? The big deal is that there's something there from God, right? That's got to be the realization. We can't go, well, that's, there's nothing there. I'm moving on, you know. We say, Lord, if there's something there, or if it's your timing to be able to show me this, um, or if you want to store that for another day, then I ask you, you said you, you sent the Holy Spirit that he could bring to remembrance 
those things that pertain to Jesus. So this is one that I have no clue what that is. It's good to regularly read the Bible and say, I have no clue what that means. Okay. <clears throat> and usually the ones who seem to know the Bible so well, they will tell you that there are massive amounts of the scriptures that they don't know anything about. Massive, you know. People come up to me all the time. I mean, in these trips and stuff, and they'll come up with their Bible and they say, well, Brother Andy, what does this mean? And I'll look at it and I'll see if the Holy Spirit's going to tell me anything right there on the spot. And if it doesn't, I go, I don't have a clue. I've, had, I've done that to people and they said, what? You're a pastor and you don't have a clue? Nope. You know, and I've had, you'd be surprised how many I've said, well, that's refreshing. I've had one say, every pastor I've ever asked anything, they knew all the answers. And I said, who is he? I want to sit under him or, or sit on him, one or the other. <clears throat> all right, and lo, a voice from heaven. That's not even telling you the being, is it? Okay, why, why, why wouldn't it not? Because we need to know things that, that tie this being together because this being isn't really just one. This being is three in one, but it's one. But it's three in one. And so right now we're just hearing a voice from heaven and it says, this is my beloved son. Ah, that's the father. <laughs> But we don't assume that until we get to that part. We have to at first say, this is just a voice from heaven, and he's not going to declare himself. He's declaring the Son. He is not going to talk about himself. He's not going to go, I'm the, I'm the father of this whole thing. Every good and perfect gift comes from me. You know, He's not going to declare himself. Jesus, when he walked the earth, declared him. Ah, Big clue as to the being of God there. Big clue. All right. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay, so in whom? In whom? It's in, in this beloved son. It's not, it's not the body that God gave him, you know, 30 years ago. Because, well, it's turned out nice. <laughs> You know, he's not, you know, this is my beloved son. He looks good. He's a fine looking boy. Hey. You know? <laughs> my son's a fine looking boy. But instead, it's in whom that he is pleased. All right, well, what's that say about a class on being? It says that God the Father is looking for a certain thing pertaining to our being, not our great Christianity. Well, I'm a great Christian. He's going to love me. Well, maybe not. I know, I should have been crucified a long time ago, but they'll show up someday. Anyway, because I'm just saying, it's, you know, God didn't say, and he will bring Christianity to the masses. And lo, the earth shall be filled with steeples. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased, well pleased. Okay. Well, I mean, if you really want to take it like that, you could, someone could sta be standing there and go, Jesus, uh, when did you start your ministry? <laughs> and Jesus would go, well, I'm just starting. Because he was, remember? He was. First he went out and got tempted, then he comes and gets baptized. He's just starting. He hadn't done anything yet. Not a thing. The father's going, I'm really pleased with the work you've done. You were... You showed up at birth and 12 years old, and then we didn't hear a thing out of you. I'm really blessed that you just kept your mouth shut. Well, there's some truth to that, but we, we don't want to, not necessarily with Jesus. 
<clears throat> okay, so also let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, this one you should know by heart, but it goes on. John 1.1 1, 1 is simply, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right. I, I probably blew it tonight, and so I'm going to do it right now. So give me a second to write something on the board. I wrote part one, and I'm not talking about this class as part one. I'm talking about this portion that we will probably be going for a while is only the first part. And the reason why I say that is and the reason why I was only reminded now and, and helped me remember that I put part one up there with this every time is because the Word of God, the Word in the beginning was the Word, is nothing like most people think that it is. It's nothing like it. And it is a huge area that when he drew me into, I just, you know, the best, thing to do, the best thing to do is when God draws you into an area that you just make a nest and sit on it. We usually want to grab the parts and run and go tell people and, and they'll go, oh, this is good and that's good and this was really good, but they're not getting the being of it. And so this right here, this area, I've been sitting on for years and years and years. And Lord willing, if we get to part two of all that I want to share, we are going to be uh, introduced to the word. We're going to be introduced to the word. And that's not saying I know everything about it, but I guarantee that it's, it's going to, you'll see it. Once, once, isn't it funny how once somebody says it or once you see something, then you, oh, yeah, of course, makes sense. But if you don't, it's like, well, I know what that stands for. Jesus, in the beginning was the word. Jesus was a big book before time. <laughs> or whatever. I'm sure you didn't think that. But, but I'm sure there's somewhere somebody's taught that. <clears throat> All right. So. This is talking about in the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The next verse, though, says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay. Is that verse 2 or is that 3? Three? 3. All right. So... <clears throat> we're seeing, what, what are we seeing? We're seeing in the beginning was the Word, and then we're seeing the Word making all things. So there's two beginnings there, and it's important to understand. The first beginning is that which was and is and is to come. Jesus describes himself in the book of Revelation constantly on that basis. I mean, by the time you get down there, he's like, look, the being of this thing has always been and always will be, okay? But then the being started at another beginning. All things were made by him. There's your second beginning, okay? So the being was there before anything was made. And then he chose to make all things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some Christians tend to think that there is an eternal truth out there somewhere that we must lay hold of and secure for ourselves. Okay. So this is something that drives Christians, not just Christians, but a lot of people. <clears throat> there is a, an eternal truth out there. And I need to, to, to lay hold of that and secure that and have that working in me. <clears throat> uh, 
That is why there are so many conferences, revivals, books, and recordings to be found. But it is not just some great truth that came forth from God that we must pursue. We are those who came forth from God in Jesus Christ. All of that's being stuff. Okay? We must find the truth as it pertains to ourselves and to the being from which and for which we exist. Does that make sense? We can, we can set <clears throat> a guy with a beard and sandals and a robe on a throne in our mind every time we pray. See, we can go, oh, Jesus, you know. Well, that beard and robe and sandals never represented his being. But that's what we see, and we put it on a throne, so that gives it, that makes it legit. Now it's legit. <clears throat> No, no. We, we came out from a being in that he created us, and then, in, and we're talking about it, new birth, created us a new, not just after his kind and in his image, but with his very being placed within us. It's huge. It's a big difference. And to capture that, to capture that and to really, I mean, I'm just talking about grasping the concept, really refocuses your search for the Lord. It refocuses it. <clears throat> we either exist according to our own perceptions concerning ourselves or we find and embrace the supreme being's reason for bringing us into existence or the being's reason for bringing us into, into existence. You know, when we talk about supreme, um, it really doesn't, I mean, in a certain sense, I mean, we say, okay, so he's, he's, um, he was God before everything. Um, he made everything, okay. Here we go again. He's all powerful, all knowing. He's, He's the caretaker of the zoo. <laughs> and it's his responsibility if we break a leg in the zoo for him to patch us up. I wonder if the way I share things ever offends anybody. I, I, I can't imagine. <clears throat> I'm just trying to show you the way we look at the supreme of the being. We put more emphasis on the supremeness than knowing the being. Okay. Um, we either exist according to our own perceptions concerning ourselves or we find and embrace the supreme being's reason for bringing us into existence. The Bible must also be approached in this same manner, the Bible. We may study it in order to grasp Jesus, but most come away with a picture of Jesus based solely upon ink on white paper. Do you understand what that means? That means that we, we make the, what, the, what is written on ink and white paper that that's God. Can we put God, let's just this time call him the supreme being down in ink and then slap it on paper? Can we? No. Okay, so then what happens then? We, well, Brother Randy, you tell us to search the scriptures and you tell us that Jesus will be revealed in the scriptures, so you, you contradict yourself. No, I'm not. Because the Holy Spirit is going to reveal the life behind the words. He's going to reveal the life behind the words. I got saved reading the Bible, trying to disprove God. What do you think of that? 
you say, well, you're a bad person. Well, so was Paul, because <laughs> he was doing the same kind of stuff. But I did. I was going to disprove. Well, and in fact, that phrase was the one that I used. Well, God contradicts itself. The Bible contradicts itself. Okay. So I'm reading it so I can find all these things that prove, well, I could, that contradicts what he said over here. Have you ever read the Bible where a place sounded like it contradicted something else? Of course, I think there's plenty of those kind of things. But while I'm reading it, not even going, oh, please save me, or, you know, I want to know you, or, you know, there's nothing sincere about me reading the Bible. There was nothing sincere about me. I was, I, again, I wasn't just insincere, I was trying to disprove his word. And bam! Excuse the meter on there. Bow! All of a sudden, that Randy guy that was so crazy became so calm and sweet and innocent. <laughs> no, that's not what happened. What happened was Christ came into me. He became my life. I can't explain how all that happened. I can't explain, you know, how it happened with Paul. We think, well, it's because of the state of my heart. But what if, like with Paul, Paul's going, I like this guy. He is the worst of the worst of the worst, and I like using the worst. So I think I'm going to knock him off of his donkey and begin to reveal myself in him so that nobody would glory in the person who is trying to disprove all this. Well, what are you saying, Brother Randy? Are you saying I should turn against God and that he'll save me or he'll reveal his son in me? I, I have no explanation for all that. I just tell you the facts. And what is, what is the point of doing that? I think we need an expanded view of our God. I think that the Spirit of God would like for us to do this class more than a class and then just enter into what the Spirit of God was showing me and the same Spirit that showed me 10, 15 years ago is here right now and that he would want to take these same things and bring forth life out of them to us and literally reshape the being that we call God. So I'll read this again. The, the Bible must also be approached in this same manner. We may study it in order to grasp Jesus, but most come away with a picture of Jesus based solely upon ink on white paper. Y'all see now why I wrote it like that? When we study the Bible to evaluate the meaning of the words so that we may formulate a belief system, we again miss the mark. Should I read that one again? We study the Bible to evaluate the meaning of the words so that we may formulate a belief system. We again miss the mark. I'm not looking for a belief system. I'm not looking for stuff to believe. I'm looking for Jesus. <laughs> you know, I figure, you know, the whole thing to me sounds like if you believe in him. We say, well, I believe that he saved me. It, that's not believing in him. That's believing what he did. I don't know, you know, you can tell that I, I wanted to know him beyond just the regular things that we all claim that that's the, that's the deal right there. But when we go to the word of God asking the Holy Spirit to reveal the author, isn't he called the author in the Bible? The author and finisher? But when we go to the Word of God, asking the Holy Spirit to reveal the author, then we may find the true meaning of the words. He knows what he authored there, and he knows how to bring the book alive. You say, well, that's kind of a weird way to put it. Paul put it that way. You are God's epistles. Remember that? 
You are God's epistle. You're the, you're the book openly read by others. But it's not the book, it's the life of the book. <clears throat> then we may find the true meaning of the words. That true meaning is Christ. Jesus is the sum of the book. But though we all may be familiar with references to Jesus Christ, yet we may find in this study that it is more eternal in nature than the picture we have drawn of him from the Gospels. See, I knew I hadn't touched this thing in years and years and years, so here's a misspelled word, and it doesn't want me to be, even put a cursor down. Well, I curse or you. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to stop, and I need a second here to make my new thing. So basically we're we're done. It's just me wanting to pray when we get done here. They won't usually take this long, but I have to add this thing that I put in all of my sharing so that I remember exactly where we stop so that I'm not doing this at the beginning of class going, where did we leave off? You know, y'all are looking at me going, you don't know, you idiot, you're the teacher. Well, I don't. <laughs> Father, we just <clears throat> are entering just barely, just stepping, just not even our toe fully into the water of Jordan. But we <clears throat> want to cross over from the land that we've known, from the lands that we've known, from the understandings that we've had. We don't want to cross over like Israel did. We want to cross over like Paul did. We want to, we want every bit of what we think and believe to be counted but dung that we may win Christ. We're serious, but we believe you started this, this time of sharing. We believe that this is in your heart, that we step further into your heart, that we step further into your heart and into knowing you so that we can relate with you the way you are instead of relating to you the way we are. Father, there are those of us who are stirred already. We're stirred deeply. We're stirred enough to say, yes, do it, do it, do it. There are others, we're still, we're still trying to feel our way in the darkness of an area we're not familiar. May your spirit gently guide them to the, to the area of knowing you that you guided me. May it not be me guiding anything. May it not be the words that you shared with me guiding anything, but may it be your spirit. And may it be their own journey, their own journey to find you because their heart yearns, because their heart longs to know you as you are. So Father, thank you, thank you, thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the being that you are and the being that the Trinity is. May we do more than glimpse the truth of this. May we enter into it as of oneness. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. There's no, yeah, go ahead.